This is flipped mini lecture number 35 on Newton's universal theory of gravitation. And I'm going to cover night 13.1 to 13.4. And we'll work on that stuff in class on Thursday. And actually, you have a couple of warm up problems on that tonight. So here's how it got started, at least if you go and look at Newton's Principia. Newton imagined himself on a mountain. So here's Newton, here's a mountain, he's up here, and he's got himself a cannon. Okay, so there's, there's the surface of the earth, there's the mountain sitting on the surface of the earth, there's a cannon sitting on top of the mountain. And Newton says, suppose I uh, shoot the cannon. And he shoots a cannon, and the ball goes into parabola. Cannonball goes in a parabola. You guys already know how to do that because you know projectile motion. You know if you know the horizontal velocity and you know G, you can figure out where it'll hit the ground and what's, you know, how broad that parabola is. And then Newton says, suppose I had a bigger, better cannon that could shoot the cannonball harder. And you're like, well, okay. It would look like this. It would go further before it hit the ground. And then Newton says, suppose I've got a super duper duper cannon. And now I'm gonna start drawing in the curvature of the earth here, okay? Suppose I've got a super duper duper cannon and I shoot it so hard that the actual curvature of the earth here really gets noticeable. Well, not only is that cannonball going to start uh, go further because it's a super duper duper cannon, but it's going to go further because if the earth was flat, it would have hit over here. Just like the second one would have hit there and the first one would have hit there. If the earth was flat, it would have hit here, but this is such a super duper cannon that it's noticeable that the earth's curving away. So actually it's going to get, not only going to get further because the cannon's bigger, it's going to get further because the earth's curving away. Then Newton said, Suppose I had such a superb cannon. So I'm drawing the whole earth here, okay? Not a very round earth, but you'll have to imagine it. Suppose I said, Newton says, I have such a superb cannon that as the earth curves away, it could go like halfway around the earth before hitting. Okay? And then Newton says, suppose I have the dream cannon. The dream cannon is going to fire so hard that as the cannonball curves downwards, the earth curves downwards by exactly that same amount. So yes, the cannonball keeps curving downwards, but so is the earth curving downwards. It's going to keep curving downwards, curving downwards, curving downwards, curving downwards, curving downwards, comes right back around and hits the back of the cannon. Uh, this is an example of a thought experiment. Obviously, Newton didn't have a cannon like this. But with this thought experiment, Newton convinced himself that the same thing that causes cannonballs to go in parabolas towards the ground is the same thing that keeps the moon in orbit. And he realized that absolutely everything pulls on everything else. The cannonball pulls on the earth, the earth pulls on the cannonball. The, can the earth pulls on the moon, the moon pulls on the earth. Everything pulls on everything else. And that's why he called it the universal theory of gravitation. And this gravitation explains both projectile motion and it explains orbital motion. Which by Newton's time, you know, we had the, not just the Earth orbiting the Sun and the Moon orbiting the Earth, but uh, Galileo had uh, seen that the moons of Jupiter uh, orbit the Jupiter. So, um, you know, we were starting to get a lot of evidence that everything pulls on everything else. Um, and it's Newton that figured out uh, how much, in what direction, and married this to the laws of mechanics that you've already learned. Now here's what Newton's universal thought law of gravitation says. It says if you have one mass, and let's call that mass M1, and if you have another mass, and let's, let's call that mass 
m2 and for the moment here we're going to treat them as point masses don't worry about the fact that the earth is a big thing okay we're going to treat the earth as a point we're going to treat the earth as if it's a point and it's all concentrated right at the spot at the center of the earth and this mass that's over here which might be this pen in this room uh is we're going to imagine that, that this pen in this room is still like 3500 miles away from the center of the earth which it is so don't worry about the extent of the earth yet it says, if you have a point mass, M1, and a point mass, M2, and if the center of the point mass, like in this case, the center of the Earth, and the center of the other mass, like that case, the center of this pen, are separated by a distance R, R, then the amount of force between M1 and M2 is the universal constant, capital G, times the first mass, which in this case might be the mass of the Earth, times the second mass, which in this case might be the mass of the pen, divided by, not the distance between them, not the distance between them cubed, not the distance between them the fourth power, but divided by the distance between them squared. Now let's make that a little more precise. You know Newton's third law that says that whatever one does to two, two must go back to one and in exactly the opposite direction. So this is the amount of pull. And we can say that F of 1 on 2 is equal to that, and F of 2 on 1 is equal to that. And these are all magnitudes, OK? Like, see how I've written that with no vector sign over it, and that with no vector sign over it, and there's no vectors over here? So what I'm talking about right now is the magnitudes of the forces. These are all magnitudes so far. In fact, if you wanted me to be really pedantic about it, I could write it like that. But we know that the magnitude of a vector is conventionally just written as that same vector without the vector symbol and without the magnitude signs. So there's a nice, tidy, short way of writing uh, the force of 2 on 1 and the force of 1 on 2. They have equal magnitudes, and of course they have opposite directions. This thing is tugging this thing towards it. And this thing is tugging this thing towards it. So they are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And that, by the way, is Knight Equation 13.2. Now, this big constant over here, capital G, it has a number, a value associated with it. If you measure everything in kilograms, it's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. G is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. And the next thing we need to figure out is, uh, well, A, how did Newton get that? Um, but let me show you, suppose you knew that Newton got that. Let's calculate the amount of gravity at the surface of the Earth. Let's figure out, let's make, let's be a little more explicit here and say that uh, this is one and this is two. And this is, this two thing is something that's sitting here like my pen cap or this eraser here on the surface of the Earth. And this one thing is the Earth. So I'm going to make this one thing, I'll, I'll actually make that E for Earth. E for Earth, M E for M Earth. And the two you know here refers to the mass of this or the mass of that. It's something sitting on the surface of the Earth. And remember, I said it's the distance between their centers, and the center of the Earth is a certain distance away from us, and I'm looking it up right here right now. The center of the Earth is 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters away from us. 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters away from us. Okay, so we're going to stick this value for the distance right in here, and we're going to stick this value for capital G right in there. And then the only thing we need left is the mass of the stinking Earth, which is awfully big. It turns out it's 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms.
And let's put in, uh, let's say, one kilo for M2. Okay? Just for ducks. I mean, obviously, this pen doesn't weigh one kilo, nor does this eraser. But let's put in one kilo for M2. Now, go stick that into your calculator. Actually, I really recommend it. Stop all your video for a second. Go stick that into your calculator. 6.7 times 10 to the minus 11 in the numerator times 6.37 times 10 to the 6 uh, goes in the denominator after you square it. 5.98 times 10 to the 24 goes in the numerator right there. And then one kilo is going to be for the second object. Okay, well, I did it. And uh, I got 9.82 newtons. <coughs> Let me just round that to 9.8 newtons. Does that sound familiar? What thing has come up as 9.8 over and over again in this course? It's what we call the acceleration due to gravity. It's actually not a coincidence at all that if you plug one kilo into this, you get 9.8 newtons. Why? Because if you didn't know about all this, if all you knew about that here on the flat earth, that there was some force of the earth on any object, you'd take all these combination of things right here. So let me write that out. So this is the force of the earth on the pen. If you didn't know about Newton's universal law of gravitation, you'd take this whole combination of things, none of it you really care about, and you just give them a name. And they are what multiplies the mass of the pen, or the mass of the eraser, or the one kilo in the example here. You take this whole combination of things right here and you give it a name, the name we gave it earlier in the course, was little g. Okay, so it's not a coincidence whatsoever that we got 9.8 newtons for uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation of applied to the earth and an object of one kilogram because uh, that is where all that came from. The coefficient of M2 is uh, 9.8, when you multiply all those things together, meters per second squared times M2. And that is the thing we've decided for convenience to call that entire combination little g. So now I've covered both a little bit of history, which was 13 and 1 and 13, 2. I've covered 13, 3, which is the formula for Newton's uh, universal law of gravitation. And then I've actually also covered 13, 4, which is the relationship between little g and big G. All you have to do is plug in the radius of the Earth squared, the mass of the Earth, multiply it by big G, and you've got little g. And in our next flipped lecture, since you already understand all the basics here now, we're going to get on to 13.5, which is gravitational potential energy.